address the global challenges that AI poses. The Silicon Valley, with its presence of main global players in this field, growth from the private sector and academia, represents, of course, the best location where to foster such cooperation. So thank you again for this great opportunity. I don't want to take more time. I think we're all interested to listen to the speakers. And I thank, again, Bette for being here tonight. Eric and, of course, Open Austria once again for <coughs> all the ongoing support and offering this wonderful galvanized space. Grazie, and I hope you'll have a wonderful debate. Without further ado, we will jump straight into the matter. And it's a like, great pleasure to introduce you the first keynote speaker, Leo Kerkainen. Leo, Leo came all the way from far Finland. He works for Nokia Open Labs, where he's had a, a research team on artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, Leo is also a professor at Aalto University, and both of these jobs have earned him an invitation to the European Union High Level Group on Artificial Intelligence, which perhaps you have noticed has issued recently draft guidelines on the ethical or trustworthy, on the ethical development of trustworthy AI. Leo, floor is yours. Thank you, Peter, and thank you for inviting me here in the front of this wonderful audience. Uh, I will go directly to the question around here, figuring out what we have been done. So the structure of my talk will be so that you actually get a little inside of you. So I have lots of ethical dilemmas here stating around which we actually, which I think that in this document that is actually going to be finalized very soon, has solved in a nice way. So, and I give you in the suspense that when you read the document, you can actually see how this has been, they have been solved. Um, we think that, that you need, oh, yes, my very right. <laughs> so, so uh, I think that it actually has to combine, uh, trustworthy AI has to combine three things. Uh, it has to be law abiding. And of course, even in that sentence, there's always whose law and where the law is, and all countries, even dictatorship, you actually call it around. There's also discussion about that. Ethical, in the sense they also different kind of diversity in ethical standards, for example. Does one have the right to abortion or doesn't have the right to abortion, for example, is an ethical question, and one figuring out whether a system that actually would make diagnosis would allow that or not, or suggest that or not. And it has to be robust, which means that it actually is predictable in the sense it provides good answers in a way. And, and these are all kind of questions that are not trivial even to, to actually produce what they would be. So what one has is ethical principles, and we have stated this kind of four basic principles that are very, very kind of important to the setting, saying that the machines should not take power, they should not be sky and coming up on that neck. Uh, in principle, we should think about not making harm. Of course, this depends on the ability to predict the future. Whatever you do, there will be butterfly effects that so that, that it takes non intended consequences, how do you deal with these cases? So how do you actually make viable the system? It should be fair. So if we think whether they would be kind of a balance between females and males in the system or the decisions that it, it is doing. Uh, also, it should not be discriminatory. Uh, it should have a certain expl explicability and responsibility in the system. So what is the liability, liability structure in the system? And, and, and how to explain how the decisions have done. And I have very kind of simple rules explainability very often, which is very efficient. When the AI makes a decision, then what you want to know, what should I make do differently if, if to make the decision different? And that is actually what, what in most cases kind of matters for people. It doesn't matter how many weights you have in your norm to figure out that out on different levels. And they are, of course, requirements for trustworthy AI. So it's habits. It's even extended looking about this is this kind of oversight, human oversight on the system. There's robustness and safety issues, privacy and data governance, they're all important issues, transparency. So we should make it in such a way that, that, that you don't hide the logic that is, that is behind the system, uh, especially if it's the kind of a very important decision that you are going to do. Uh, diversity and non-discrimination, of course, everybody wants to save the world. Environment and, and social well-being has to be kind of applied in the system. And again, uh, accountability is a system of being. So these are the things that we think that should in, in contact. And in, it's not for a, all AI programs. It is this kind of guideline which is true in the setting that, that if you want to have your AI in a game or something like that that ha has no influence in outside the domain, you should actually have a proportional response. If you are making an X-ray, X-ray based kind of a kind of a, a diagnosis system, then it is a different. Then you have more strict rules on, on the setting. How do you do it? That you should actually apply it in a different way. Uh, in, okay. 
okay, looking around on a way so that, 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 that going to history is always good to go back. So we had industrial revolution in automated human work. It actually was a kind of a machine already that has this centripetal wall around there that actually used the steel that is going into the machine. You see, I'm physicist, I want to talk about these things. That was not possible in the Greek time. And when you made it, that, that definite control system, it actually made the machine, the, the steel machine work. So it was AI to an extent it makes things fast and then you in, in the city. In time, they, they become the industrial sector, figuring out a post-industrial society, strong service sector, in the, and we think that that actually saves our all jobs in the setting from the automated industry. That is not true, so all the automating services happen in the, in the times of the Babish was thinking about this, how to make machines and how to make systems that actually do reasoning. So AI is not the new thing. It's very old in the system. Information revolution has going for 70 years, it has transformed our lives already. We have automatic decision making that, that, that thanks, and we have actually been facing this dilemma already quite a long time. Now what the system is, is changing in a way that because first time we can also make systems that behave almost on the part of humans in some services, like in speech recognition, object recognition, and we can make services that are really automated. And what is going to happen, there is quite a lot of, of professions that are going to weigh on, on, on that in the, in, in the same. And what is the point about losing a profession, like an interpreter, for example? There may be professional ones that are very good at it, but, but basic interpreter does not, is not needed anymore if you have a good Google translation in your hands. So what it means that, that, that everybody gets the capability. It's not so that something is going away. It's actually going so away that, that when automation comes, it creates you kind of a master magic wand that gives you the capability of doing those things that are, are, are free. And it allows us to do totally new things in a totally new manner. And this is why I'm excited about this. This is what changes the world. So again, looking around, going to run, correct decision. There are some discussion about the system on, 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 on the system. The modern technology has this inhuman time scales. It can be a thousand times faster than any humans that they are doing those things. So now we are asking this question, to what degree we have to give decision power to machines? So where is there? To what degree we already have done that? That's a question about this group, what, what, what is software driven? And and if we say that there is no ultimate decision making, then what happens is that we are not actually getting the benefits of the AI, which is here on the speed. So these are all the, dis I, again, the discussion points. So looking at what my definition of AI is very simple, it's this anti-literal mechanism for AI, the first ever I knew. So a computer that, that figures out the, the position of the planets. So then comes with some rule-based systems that are, are, are coming from the Babbage times. And then comes machine learning around for 50 years, programs that do programs, figure out. This is actually very, I think, academics think that this is really AI. They don't agree with me, the software being AI. So, and then there's phase three. So that is what the thing is guided is doing. So this phase three, so is it possible to make these sentient machines? That's a question, is it a threat? I don't know, it's hard to see the future. It's the kind of system. Okay, let me go over. So traffic is a good example. So this is how modern traffic is working. So this is from Peter Stoll from University of Texas, Austin. So you can see what happens in the intersection. Can you drive with this kind of traffic? There's no way of you getting in there. So this is very fast going around, very effective, no traffic rules anymore. All the kind of cars negotiate how they go through it. But of course, if you really look at the real traffic somewhere, it is the same thing. <laughs> so nothing much has changed in the world. So machines are very good at copying things. I don't know, they don't, don't do so much for new things in the, in the setting. So. And then this is what is happening. When we build self-driving cars, we actually copy how humans behave. Is this good or bad? So we say actually, they, we get the same ethics that people have. We have, like driving through the red lights. Do we pay that to the machine as well? People do it. Now we have to figure out where are the limits. How do we actually make, make machines that are a little better than we? Is that possible or not? In the settings, so how to do that? Um, there is even, here from Berkeley, I, I, I like this thing it was. If you just let somebody in, 
some uh, self driving car in the setting. I guess I bet you have seen it. It actually starts helping in rush hours. Traffic. Just the four thing, kind of a one, one uh, automatic vehicle in the class is actually taking quite a lot of the rush hour already. So they, here we get an example of how we try on the, on the system. And 10% of those is making traffic much, much easier. So letting these self driving cars into the traffic actually takes rush hours out. So they're helping us. So it's not something that we should be kind of afraid of. Then there's kind of a question, ethical question around here, which is about secondary influence. Even if people would decide, I don't want to use AI in any, any circumstances what I have, there are these rules about this other people using AI as the influence you And what degree that is kind of possible in this, is that, that, that accepted or not? How do we handle this secondary third theory of kind of a, even more degree of, of influencing on the, on the, on the system? Okay, we can have machines that have new senses. So this is from MIT. Looking nicely about things, you can actually see better than, than, than other people. You can see micro gestures that people do, or micro, micro expression, you can figure out whether they lie. Now the question is, should machines see only the things that we see as well? To keep the, the level of view kind of even on that. So is the data that, okay, uh, somebody says that I have to keep it. <laughs> So again about data, I guess Lee Fei Fei is a good example of how to actually get the real data. So that was the first thing. That started the revolution currently, how to build the efficient database. Uh, turn it to knowledge by asking lots of people how to annotate them. This was a big effort in how, how to do it. And then now the question is that how to use the gather data ethically. So is all the data, all that we get, is it always good for every purpose that we do we make things that are, that is not self-driving in the sense, but it actually would follow, that you, you follow the rules by itself? And then it would automatically detect you when you over speed. Is that a nice, nice version of an AI on the system? I don't think so. This is kind of massive surveillance. Uh, how to answer the quality of the annotation, because everything that you put in annotation may end up in the, in the logic of the program itself. So this is also. And then, all the ethical decisions that we do in the training, they get copied to the machine. And what happens in that time, the ethics changes in time. We think that the, when new times comes, we change the rules, how we think that what is allowed and what is not allowed. Yeah. Then what happens on that? How do we actually keep training the programs in such a way that they are, they are going to be con contemporary? Even X-ray machines actually grow old in the, in the setting that they are not so powerful like the future machines. How to train them again and again and again to actually have this capabilities and to make and what are the rules to decide how you do it? What is the legislation that you actually approve the X-ray kind of a mechanism and then you suddenly say that okay now it is not valid anymore because I have such much better machines? Perhaps should happen in that. So here is a way of how to automate things at about kind of a record about how much data you need. For example, 30,000 patients for cardiologists, 130 visits for retinopathy and eye doctor in a, in a thinking. One it was for Google, one was for Stanford University. Uh, from here you see that what is really going to happen is that, that what are impacted are the professions are, are, which are the most high paid currently. There's no sense of actually doing AI or anything else. So it's not for low pay grade, pay grade job position, it's actually for the highest ones which are trained to automate. You make a cardiologist with automation, you say, okay, too bad for the cardiologist, but I would say that it is very good because we can make automated system that everybody who is wearing the device every day can actually have a cardiologist level kind of a thinking and make predictive healthcare outcome. Because we can react five years before problems happen. That's the thing, how you actually make it so in a sense that, that brings the society something out when you have capability of making something very, very cheap, which was expensive before. Is again my point? Yeah. So there's a lot of things in the world that are not done yet. They are not economically viable, but you should still do that. AI is going to help you. That. So here is a policy, this is our research in the setting. So how to do this kind of a sleep staging. Uh, making now something like 1,000 times faster. Uh, we are pretty good at it, so it actually think it takes one sleep nurse to take 30 seconds to, to, to sleep at a couple of seconds to estimate the, the sleep stage on that. We can do the whole night at that time. In 
specific. This is also making possible to, to much better kind of understanding of all things. Here is, everybody knows how deep learning neural networks works. Every does. Who doesn't? No, 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 everybody knows. <laughs> Are these black boxes? I think this is black boxes in a way that, 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 that you have ever played black boxes, black boxes. So they actually tell you everything that happens. <coughs> Every decision is totally out of there. The only problem is in the scale. You have 100 million decisions, it's hard to figure out what is actually happening. But if something is that complicated, it requires 100 million decisions. Should we kind of not do it because of that? Okay, I, I keep my question. Uh, there is a privacy. Here is an example of what we use generally from adversarial networks to take people's faces and change them. So here is our CEO from the company. And also Risto, who is, who is our chair of our commander, and we change the faces. So anonymization is kind of solved. You can you play the game from the games like that. Uh, but still, I would say that the, the, the final protection is always constructed. There's always going to be a technology that does it other ways. You really have to make sure that you have, you have uh, agreements how you actually reserve the data, how you actually handle it. It really requires this kind of a very concise way of how to preserve data privacy in the, in the system and how to build the system that do that. Uh, so here is an example, another one. So it is a fun example about taking glasses out of the people and then, 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 then putting, them, putting the people back without the glasses. Uh, there is no temporary consistency here, so we did not just use it, but this was just for fun. But of course what we do here is, is uh, that we just de-anonymize somebody. Because this kind of thing is, it's very easy going to, to that kind of process system. So there is going to be a method, and, and with all methods of anonymizing, something doesn't, won't, won't work, but they, they say, yeah. So how to actually make really sure that you still can get these anonymized data sets on? My last topic is about this kind of thinking about what is the both kind of size of the data. So Shakespeare trained it, there is this kind of a recurve recur neural network you can play the next data. So this is coming out of the text out of the prediction. It knows it has nothing else input than what is the next letter in Shakespeare's books. So now it can make a grammar quite nice. It just tells you whatever. So no sentient being around in the system. You can do the same for sound. Google has done it. There's some, some work. I guess everybody has heard that. So it's the combination now. So it's totally mismatch of, 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 of something that is coming in. There's no meaning on the on the sound that the music is bad. So so these are all the so but it still actually can make almost like it would be a language. You can do so just predicting the next uh, but there is a future development here which is saying that, that more is given more. So OpenAI is got just lately made this funny program of figuring out what is the word with a huge amount of data, much more than these previous ones. And then there is an example about this. That if there is a prompt, human is writing something and then asking the, the computer what is the next word. And there is the story that comes out of it. So it's not anymore whatever. It's actually quite a nice story about what is coming out of thinking. Of course, it's totally inventive on, on the sense. And that's the, part, the fun part in the taking, that you can start making take news with the system. There is a certain understanding of the domain already existing. And that means that there is a qualitative change that happens if you, act, if you can get an update or something. In the, in the, okay, that was it. Short question. Quite some food for thought already. Uh, our second speaker is the CEO of EIT Digital, Willem Jonker, representing the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, which has been created in 2008 um, as an EU initiative to boost innovation and entrepreneurship across Europe. It represents the largest innovation ecosystem of more than 1,000 partners at pan European level and addresses global challenges in the areas of digital, climate, food, health. Manufacturing, raw materials, energy, and urban mobility. Before leading EIT Digital as its first and until now only <coughs> chief executive, uh, Willem enjoyed a career as a business executive, for example at Philips, but also in academia, where he is also a professor in computer science at the University of Twente in the Netherlands. Willem, want to go to this one? Thank you very much.
that's really fascinating. I mean, when I when I see these 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 video clips, all you can do with AI, it's 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 uh, it's really great, and it's it's always what I tell my students. I mean, you are so blessed to do computer science because we are going to solve all the problems of the world. We have AI, so that will cover for about 80% of all the problems. And the 20% left, blockchain. <laughs> so, I actually uh, did my PhD in uh, already 30 years ago, and the subject was expert systems. And I think nowadays you are allowed to say that's AI. <laughs> And uh, then the AI winter arrived. Um, that's why I ended up managing. So sorry about that. And uh, what did fundamentally change? Let's say if you wind back 50 years to today, and when it comes to AI, uh, my statement is always: it's not mainly the algorithms that changed. But it's mainly what changes is computing power and availability of data. And the combination of the two allows you to do things that you were not able to do before. And to give you a bit of a feeling how computing power improved, I think you recognize this device. I'm not advertising, I only get paid 100 bucks for showing this one to you. 50 years ago. You know what would be the size if with the technology of 50 years ago you would build the power that is in this machine? Of course, I take a European example. How much would you say? The size? Any guess? This room? This room. This room. Almost there. Yeah. Eiffel Tower. Well. The computer would have the size of an Eiffel Tower. It would need a battery, right, to run. Two nuclear power plants. Okay? So that is what happened in 50 years. So maybe now you get a bit of a feeling why a lot of these applications, where I could only dream of when I did my PhD in computer science and artificial intelligence in those days, become available now. And there's more to come because I'm sure that 20 years from now, these devices will be even more powerful and then we get this great autonomous systems that drive you all the way through the traffic jam. I will now tell you a little bit about uh, not this visionary part of AI, but more what does AI mean today in practice? Because the mission of the European Institute of Innovation and Technology is not so much doing research and advancing research, because we have other European programs like the European Research Council that is really driving that. Now this is very much about, we create a lot of knowledge, we create a lot of technology, how do we bring it to the market? How do we package it? And I want to show you a little bit where we stand and where today really the money goes when it goes to early application of all this brilliant technology. Uh, this one? Okay. Oh, gosh. Professors are not very good at this. Research results uh, to the market, and I mean it was already uh, mentioned. Uh, Jurki uh, Katainen, so we, we stay a little bit in the Nordics uh, uh, here. Uh, he is the vice president for jobs, growth, investment, and competitiveness. So this is not about R and D. This is really about bringing it to the market. And he talks about uh, artificial intelligence as a mega trend, and I think we start to recognize, although the book that was just quoted mainly sees the US against the uh, China in, in these two universes. Europe is really catching up very rapidly and people understand what to do, but it's very much also about capturing all this know-how that is there into concrete applications. 
So uh, Europe uh, is very much behind these whole programs and these uh, stepping up the investments in AI in uh, Europe. And he was actually here. So you sit here, here sitting here. Uh, he was in our office in uh, here in uh, San Francisco on his visit to Silicon Valley, and we had an exchange with him on what we as Europe do here in Silicon Valley and how we show the people here that Europe is really cool again, and uh, not only cool in the Nordic sense. <laughs> Artificial intelligence for Europe, you see where our focus is, and I want to pick up two things. So uh, it's about investment also, and so of course we do the R&D and you saw examples of great things you can do in the research labs, but it's also to bring it indeed into the society. And the other thing that I want to uh, talk about is naturing talent. Because those two elements come very much in the core of our mission as EIT. What are we about? Well, we are EIT Digital, but we have seven uh, brothers and sisters in the family that yesterday all uh, came here, and we are now present really with the whole family of innovation organizations from the EIT. But this is where we are. So we have an ecosystem spread over Europe, and we are a kind of MIT, but that distributed all over the place. Well, sometimes it's fun, sometimes it's really a nuisance, because I have to be everywhere to keep the machine uh, going. But that's really on purpose. It's on purpose a spread ecosystem which connects the dots. So that's our mission and that's where our dots are made. meanwhile. And next week I will get a new slide because we open a new dot in Edinburgh. <coughs> just before Brexit or just after. I don't know how fast they are in Parliament there. And then we will have two weeks later another dot in Braga which is in Portugal. So we are not only connecting the dots, but we are also expanding our networks of dots. And we, of course, are here in Silicon Valley, uh, which did not fit on the map, so we put it there. We're about innovation and entrepreneurship. So actually, we do two things. We make sure that all these results that come out of research are packaged in a way you can scale it up and you can bring it to the society, you can bring it to the market. So that's what we call pre-incubation, and that's packaging. That's packaging the technology, that's making sure this can create venture that has a freedom to operate in terms of IP, and you make sure you get the people in, you get the team that's going to drive this to success. And we do that in a limited number of areas because you can't do everything, even not with AI. And then on the other side, we are focusing on scaling up. Because if there's one problem in Europe, then it's fragmentation. We have fragmented market, we have fragmented capital to finance early investments and especially investments around, I would say, the 15 million. If you need 50 million, you're on the radar of the big guys, so they will pick you up. If you need 3 million, you will find always some friends, families and fools that put the money into you. But there in between, you have this gap that you have to bridge. And that's what we are doing. We are the ferryman that takes you over the, hopefully not the sticks. <laughs> so, what our accelerator does, at a pan-European scale, it helps to scale up at a European level. So we build that single investment market and that single access to product market that you don't really have in reality. And we built it by connecting all those dots and having deployed a team of over 50 people in Europe that helps you to scale. And it works, because since uh, 2012 we have this uh, running, and we were able to uh, get for our portfolio uh, 550 million of private investment. Yeah, so we use the public investment to build the infrastructure and then we mobilize the private investment. And if you see the leverage factor here is about a factor of 15, which is not bad for public investments in this uh, area. And you see we also have a high uh, survival rate. 90% of our portfolio is still alive. It's very important for me as well because they only pay after two years, so if they are dead, they never get my money. So I'm very selective of those that at least survive long enough to pay back uh, their uh, investment. And what I said, we're all about education, entrepreneurial education. One of the questions that will come, and I will already give you the answer, what is the big inhibitor for the development of AI? And the question is, humans. Humans. We don't have enough skilled people, skilled talent to deploy largely this technology in our society, in our companies. So I'll give you three concrete examples of our innovation portfolio. The first one is Conux. 
And what you see is uh, the finance. Yeah? So this is a uh, 215, this is not in our portfolio. They got an initial 2 million seed round, and if you see, they accumulated, meanwhile, uh, quite a bit then, 16 million, 20 million series, 13 million series. So these guys, if these lines go up, it's a positive thing. That's our consultant presenting. So you see the employment going up, you see the customers, and so on. And this is all about applying uh, machine learning to do predictive maintenance. And predictive maintenance is very easy. I mean, do maintenance at the right point in time is really important. Because if you do it too early, it's too costly, you have to stop operation, you have to do maintenance, it's a costly thing. If you do it too late, probably the machine maintains itself and breaks. So you have an even bigger loss of production, but also uh, damage to your uh, equipment. They focus on uh, uh, railway maintenance, so they have a sensor network of intelligent sensors with machine learning on a small footprint building into this in, uh, embedded system. And that's one of our uh, portfolios that is extremely successful, our portfolio companies. Another one is Metro. This is all about energy. People tell us that something will change with this energy transition. I don't know whether it's here, but in Europe it's a big thing. And these are about a energy performance monitoring platform. Again, a lot of data, and you see the same story here. It's one of our portfolio companies. We just raised 8 million for them, and uh, we, we just signed that we will also raise the next 20 million uh, for them that they need uh, there. You see their customers and you see them going. And they have over 100 people from starting with a few founders five years ago. So this also shows that yes, we can also in Europe. You can scale your company in Europe, you can grow your company in Europe, but you have to do a little bit more effort to connect the dots. And maybe connecting the dots is a little bit easier here, but yes, we can as well. And this is for me, very, very, very nice example. Unfortunately, not with a happy ending. This is a company called Security Matters. And this company, uh, you see uh, the, the, the money raised. We raised for them in 2016 the four and a half million Series A. And the company started growing. It was a university professor. He actually was a colleague of mine at 20 University. Then uh, he moved to another university in the Netherlands. He had a small team, and first of all, he wanted to do this all on his own. And then we convinced him that he really needed some uh, uh, funding uh, to scale up his company because the technology was really very scalable. Okay, it took some time to convince. Then it took some time to find the money in the Netherlands, and he could not find the money. The five million, four and a half million he needed, he could not raise locally. So we raised it for him at the European level. And that was the investment. So you see how the company is uh, booming, but the nice thing is here at the bottom. Because in 2016, four and a half million, just before Christmas, he had an exit through an acquisition at 113 million. That's not bad, right? From five to 113 in two years' time. In Europe, yes, we can. So don't tell me that you can't do this in Europe. It takes maybe a little bit more effort. You have maybe to be a little bit smarter, but with AI we will be there very quickly, so don't worry. But we can do this. The only bad thing about it for me as a European is that you will like it. It was acquired by Forescout. And Forescout is a US company. And that shows the third problem we have in Europe. So the first thing we fixed, right? Getting access to the market, we are able to do that by connecting the dots. Getting better and more pockets of money to finance, we do it by connecting the dots. But we have another cultural problem. And the cultural problem is, the price is what you pay, the value is what you get. But the price that you are prepared to pay is very much depending on the value you perceive. And if you do not understand the value of data, you're not paying a lot of money for them. And if you take the European attitude, why should I pay in 2018 100 million for a company where I only invested 4 million two years ago? That's not gonna get you there. And that's a cultural thing. So that's the last thing to change. And changing culture is easy, so next year, though. <laughs>
I'll skip this one in the interest of time. Education. So what we do next to helping these companies grow in Europe and show that in Europe you can grow as fast and as good as you can here in Silicon Valley, we do a lot of programs at the master level, at the PhD level, and at the professional level. And these are a few examples at the master level, where you see pro two programs that are heavily AI loaded, autonomous systems program, data science program, very uh, popular programs. We enroll more than uh, 500 uh, students. We recruit uh, worldwide, and we hope they stay in Europe. The best way to keep them in Europe is to find them a partner, but as we are not in the marriage business, so we try to convince them by creating exciting companies where they want to stay. And then you see summer school, so if this summer you really want to have a good treat, come to Europe. The weather will be nice, I promise you. Mm -hmm. Climate change helps us, and we have a climate kick for that. And we have a couple of AI-focused summer schools. And of course, we're also here to connect and to learn from how things are done here. And this is a collection of courses that we run over Coursera, which is a very famous Silicon Valley-based MOOC provider. And that's the reason why we are here as well, to learn from how you build good MOOCs and how you deploy them. And as you can see, we have over 100,000 active learners on this program. We all built this over the last eight years. And uh, it's really, I must almost say, a similar exponential growth that we are witnessing with this development of our ecosystem, of the EIT family, of the things that we have. So we're here to collaborate. We are here to connect, but we are also here to convince you that Europe is a great place to be. Also for innovation, not only for research, not only for education, and that you really can also build your company in Europe in a very successful way. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, William. My name is Martin Rauchbauer, I'm the co-director of Open Austria. This is our home base, our office is here. We're very, very happy and proud to partner with EIT uh, and the European Union here tonight. And we're now going to have a panel discussing uh, the differences, uh, the likeliness of artificial intelligence in both Europe and the United States. And I would like to ask our panelists uh, to come up front. Karina Chow, Peter Pitelnik, Kay Fern Butterfield, and Eva Nahari. And before we enter into our discussions, I would like you to take out your smart devices uh, and go to the website polev.com and type in EU in USA. The reason for that is that we're going to involve you tonight uh, by asking you some questions and you can ask the panel some questions and uh, we are going to then dive into the discussion. The panelists lack microphones so I will solve that problem. Uh, and I'm going to introduce you now to the panelists. Um, some of us are Europeans living in the United States. Uh, some of us are dressed in EU colors. Uh, this was not a coincidence. Um, so let me start uh, with Kay uh, Firth Butterfield. Um, she is the head of artificial intelligence and machine learning at the World Economic Forum's Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution here in San Francisco. She's originally from the UK, uh, expert uh, of AI, uh, and has been advising numerous governments, so does the WEF, uh, around the globe. Uh, she is an expert on uh, AI and the impacts on law, ethics, and international uh, relations. Um, next uh, to her, uh, we have Rene Arvin. He's the co-founder uh, and uh, chief commercial officer of Omnibot. Uh, Rene, you, you're American, living in the United States, but Omnibot is based in Berlin. Uh, Oldenburg. In Oldenburg, but in Germany. In Germany. Okay, and it's a, um, 
AI uh, startup uh, based on conversational, it, it's a conversational AI platform and it allows OEMs to create, customize, and integrate advanced virtual assistants and bots. Voice based. Voice based. Um, and next uh, to um, K is, uh, is sorry, um, where do I have that? So, Next to Kay is Eva Nahari. She's the director of product management at Cloudera. Um, Eva is um, from Sweden originally and also advises the Swedish uh, government um, and the Swedish innovation agency Vinova. But at Cloudera, she's the director of product man management. Cloudera, most of you know it, a software platform data warehousing, machine learning, analytics, uh, distributed storage. Um, many of the internet platforms are using Cloudera. Uh, and then we have, um, to uh, uh, her right, we have uh, Karina Chow. She's the global policy lead uh, for emerging technologies at Google, uh, leading the public, Google's public policy strategy uh, on AI uh, and quantum computing and health. Uh, and in uh, pre her previous career, uh, Karina was a former White House fellow in the Obama administration at the Office of Science and Technology uh, Policy. And to the right of Karina, we have uh, Peter, um, whom you already know, the Minister Councillor of the EU delegation uh, to the United States, um, leading uh, the uh, EU's uh, priorities in the digital single market uh, in Washington, D.C. So we would like to now uh, ask you uh, our first question. So if you go to polev.com uh, and put in EU in USA, uh, we would like to ask you what future developments in AI are you most looking forward to? So uh, if it is uh, flying cars, if it is um, universal basic income, if it is never having to work, if it is never having to think, whatever it is that you are looking forward to, type it in. You want to start uh, on a note. Um, and uh, once uh, your input will appear, um, we will see it hopefully on the screen. We're having some private browsing issues, but uh, put in, uh, so you go to pollef.com and where it says username, you put um, EU in USA uh, and then uh, once we have your responses we will see a word cloud appearing um, at least that's the idea <laughs> what future developments in AI are you most looking for it seems that you're not looking forward to any future developments in AI some Okay, so we have, um, okay, automatic, self-driving cars, IoT, so we actually do have a lot of input here, autonomous vehicles, privacy safeguards, regulation, healthy population apps and decision fabrics, self-driving cars, better services, nothing. Regulation, <laughs> some, some people are <laughs> looking forward to regulation. Okay. Well, so I would uh, like to um, take this <laughs> happy inspiration and ask uh, Kay, um, who is, as I said, uh, the global uh, uh, lead of AI and machine learning at the WEF uh, here in San Francisco, um, to tell us a little bit where we are in AI at the moment, uh, what the WEF's perspective is, what the implications of AI and its current and future developments are on our, on our societies. Thank you, that's a huge amount to do in five to six minutes, so I'll be very, very quick. Um, I think it is useful just to quickly outline the work that we do at the forum, because actually that will inform some of the answers that Martin wants me to give. So what we're doing is we are creating agile governance mechanisms with multi-stakeholder partners. That's business, countries, civil society, and academics. And so when I talk about governance, I don't mean 
mean necessarily regulation, because we all know that regulation um, can impede innovation, but in some cases it might be necessary, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But also, um, regulation is often sort of the bolting the stable door after this particular AI horse has bolted. And so, if you take the problem that we have, or the problem, uh, a problem solving um, approach, <coughs> At the moment, there are lots of principles and there are lots of people saying we should do this with AI or we should do that with AI. And so what the forum is trying to do is actually say, okay, so we've got these principles, well, what do we do? Let's try and put them into action. And so I want to take that basis with you today and say, supposing you are a government, and your problem is, how do you implement AI into your actual government processes? That would be a really good idea, because as governments are huge procurers of, for example, in this case, AI, then they can set the regulatory framework without ever having to regulate. And so that's one of the things that we're doing. And actually two members of that team are here. So if you're interested in the work that we're doing on procurement, please see Sabine, um, our UK fellow, who's at the back, or Erdan, who is also at the back. And so what we're doing there is we are helping the, co-creating with the uh, UK government a set of guidelines for the procurement of artificial intelligence by the UK government. But whilst we're working with one country, actually what we're doing is we're creating a major master framework for procurement so that other countries can take these learnings and use them themselves. Problem number two, facial recognition and civil liberties. Big ethical issues. So how do we solve that? Well, at the moment we are just um, beginning to work with a country, which I can't talk about at the moment, but to really think through, is this a place where Brad Smith from Microsoft would say it needs regulation, or could it be some other agile governance mechanism? Problem number three, what is the impact of artificial intelligence on our children, on their privacy, for example? on how they learn. Well, we have a project with UNICEF um, thinking about child's rights, children's rights, he, their, they are their human rights, and um, artificial intelligence. Problem number four. If you are India, and you have a lot of small and medium-sized enterprises, how do you grow AI, which could transform your um, GDP? Well, we're working with the government of India on a data marketplace, opening up more data so that more AI businesses can start up. Problem number five, what can businesses do? Well, a lot of businesses have got high level principles, but do their boards know what they're doing? We don't think so. So we're creating tools for boards to actually understand AI and then implement them. And again, if you want to know more about that, Anna's with us at the back. <laughs> so have a word with her. with her. And finally, I mean, there are many problems, but finally, problem global governance. What do we do about AI across the globe? Well, the forum has a number of um, locations across the globe, India, China, Japan, Israel, UAE, and Colombia, and expecting probably 10 more this year, looking at these things. So growing that network of thinking about AI, both for the benefit of society and worrying about mitigating negativities. And also we're creating a global AI council of all our multi-stakeholders, which um, will meet actually in May in San Francisco, to really think about could we create 
global ethical standards? We don't know, but we'll see. Um, what should we be doing in global AI governance? So I hope that that helps you to sort of think about, you know, transitioning from talking about it to doing something about it. That's fantastic. So uh, you mentioned a number of problems uh, and challenges um, that uh, the WEF uh, is addressing and, and doing something already about it and, and developing uh, guidelines and, and ideas on a global scale uh, how to do it. But maybe we started an even uh, more uh, fundamental uh, issue and that is the, the question of defining AI uh, and what really is AI. And I would like to, to start with you, Kay. How, how, what, what, is, what is AI for, at the WEF? How do you define it? Well, I think that we bandy about word AI, if it's a word, two letters. Um, and uh, at the moment, probably what we are mostly talking about is machine learning. And so um, I think it's important that we make some distinction because if we don't, we perhaps allow um, some of the runaway fears of sentient AI to, to get in the way of things that we actually need to deal with today. So what we're talking about is systems that can learn um, given some data. And of course, we don't know, there are a number of um, uh, applications now where we're actually we're using much more as data sets, but using data and being able to process that data and learn from that data. So that's my starting point, but I expect everybody in this panel has a different view. Let's find out. So I, I would like to ask uh, uh, so, uh, to Eva, um, what is uh, your definition of artificial intelligence? Is it a misnomer, as some people say? Does it raise um, unwarranted expectations? We'll also ask you um, uh, in a moment uh, what you think are the challenges, the most pressing challenges uh, in, in the in, for artificial intelligence, but maybe we will take a moment to just simply define what every one of us means with AI. Um, so first of all, thank you for having me on this panel. It's amazing to meet all this thought leadership around the European globe <laughs> distributed. Um, second of all, a little background. I work with thousands, uh, many hundreds of customers around the world, the Fortune 2000, and their AI strategies. So I have that in my mind when I talk to you. And I, I agree with Kay that you know there's a there's a ladder of AI, you know, starting with the rules based decision systems, expert systems that has been around for ages. Uh, even when I graduated with my AI and machine learning background a hundred years ago. Good Scandinavian DNA here. But um, after that, you know, you have data sets that you can build models on and even have feedback loops. You either do supervised or unsupervised. That's where most companies turn to me or Cloudera today to help them implement their machine learning based personalized services. It's not about uh, consciousness. It, we're not a terminator yet, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're robots taking over the world. I also have visited CES, you know, Consumer Electronic uh, Show in Vegas recently. There's a lot of robots. There's a lot of uh, voice bot innovation, and it's very interesting, you know. But think about Alexa and, and Siri. You know, that's where we're at. It's still input from humans. Lots of us that train these models and, and give us back something that seems aware but it's still just taught at this point. So I agree with Kay, it's machine learning with feedback loops to create more context aware services. That's where we're at, in my opinion. Great, at Google our definition for AI is quite simple. We would define AI as a whole as the science of making things smart. And you could imagine doing that by programming a dictionary into a computer, right? Or an encyclopedia, or giving a whole bunch of knowledge to a computer program. A subset of that is exactly as what we've seen Kay and Ava talk about, machine learning. So if you think about Google 17, 18 years ago, right? A lot of people used to search for things. They would search for microphone or coffee or, or water. And a lot of the rules that went into Google search back then were 
hand-coded rules, right? If somebody searches for water, then show, you know, maybe these different water brands or these different bodies of water, right? There's a lot of if-then rules. The world has changed a lot in 17, 18, 19 years, right? People are no longer just searching in English. They're searching in hundreds of languages around the world. So it would be quite difficult to hand program all of those answers in 100, 200, 300 different languages, right? People are also no longer just searching text. They are searching um, content on the web that is video and audio and photos and uh, songs and pictures, all sorts of different kinds of content. Again, would be impossible to hand code algorithms and code for looking at all of those types of content. Um, the third thing that people are doing today, which is quite different, is they are searching for very hard queries. So people are no longer just searching microphone or water or coffee. They're searching, where is a coffee shop near me that's rated more than four stars and is friendly to kids? You know, these are really hard things. In fact, um, I think 12 or 15 percent of searches every day are new. They're unique. They're something different that Google hasn't seen before in that exact form. And so these are exactly reasons why we've had to move to machine learning as a company. And we're seeing it transform across products. We're seeing a lot of opportunities for businesses around the world. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of opportunities there. I, I, I think we are sort of falling in a bit of the machine learning. But don't be mistaken that we are talking about something fairly simple here. And this is where the interest of the European Union comes in, because we understand that the, that the, uh, the, the elements which are early in the stage of a, developing a technology have the most of the impact. And that is true for machine learning as well. Even if it is maybe portrayed as something which is there, it is working, it is simple. No, 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 no. It is not. I think we have not paid enough attention on these early stage drivers in a development. And this is where we would like to come in. This is a, a conversation where we have to be mindful because those early drivers create the biggest impact, and I suppose in the conversation we will talk about those positive or negative impacts those early drivers have. And this is also a conversation we cannot leave to the technologists only. So we, this is a, uh, uh, as you say, we should, should not uh, leave this discussion uh, to the companies only, but also I imagine coming from the EU, uh, the regulators <laughs> want to have a say there as well. But before we do that, um, from the perspective of a Europe-based uh, uh, company that is uh, not a big uh, internet platform like Google, um, but is engaged in AI, how, how, you would, you, how would you define uh, AI um, uh, from, from your perspective? Sure. So um, I'm on the commercial side. Uh, I meet with a lot of people with different uh, type of titles where AI is in it. So VP of AI, director of AI, product AI, you know, those kind of titles. Um, in the end, really, the definition of, of AI, it, it tends to be whatever the customer's definition is, right? <laughs> and uh, I would say that, uh, and I know we'll get to topics of ethics and you know, governance probably uh, as part of this, uh, in more detail as part of this conversation, but uh, I, I'm, I won't say I'm surprised, but companies are, are very careful in terms of how they think through what it is they're going to be trying to do, whether it's in terms of what kind of data they're capturing, what type of analytics they're trying to capture from uh, uh, their customers or even their employees. Uh, they think less about ethics. It's really just about regulation. What can I get away with, right? And clearly there are differences in the US and Europe. And so, you know, we may have technologies uh, on the speech side or on the NLP side or on the voice analytics side that uh, companies in the US might look to leverage uh, that the Europeans would probably not. Or, in fact, the regulations may allow them to do that. Uh, I think the other thing that uh, also uh, is kind of a common theme across a lot of the uh, enterprise companies that we deal with is that AI is human supervised. There's, I don't know that I've met really any body, any company that's willing to say we're going to go with complete self-learning models with AI at this moment, right? They're, they're really scary 
death about what that could mean. There's been a few examples uh, out in the industry of, of some big embarrassments from some of the big, uh, vendors out there who have tried to demonstrate the value of self-learning. So human supervised. So if there's something new that's going to get trained in whatever type of model is going to be developed or improved, they want to make sure that the right people within their organization are looking at it and determining, yes, this is really what needs to be trained. Okay, so I would like now to turn uh, the question again to you. Uh, so take out again your uh, devices, please. And uh, we would like to ask you, what poses the greatest uh, challenge to progress in AI today? What poses the greatest challenge to progress in artificial intelligence today? Is it privacy? Is it safety? Is it lack of government regulation? Is it, on the contrary, over-regulation? Is it lack of government funding? Uh, is it skills, knowledge, or the lack of them? So um, what poses the greatest challenge to progress in AI today? Uh, and. Uh, at the moment, it looks like skills and knowledge uh, is uh, the one thing, or the lack of skills uh, and knowledge is the one thing uh, that people um, are very worried about, also lack of annotated data. Um, interesting, not so much lack of government regulation. <laughs> so government regulation not being particularly oh, good idea. Um, and uh, privacy is an issue. Um, so uh, that's an interesting, okay, lack of government regulation getting a little bit more popularity there, but also <laughs> for regulation. <laughs> yes. So um, let's uh, discuss this a little bit. Um, what are the implications of AI? You mentioned it a little bit uh, that are um, in a sense challenging today. You, you mentioned that uh, it's about the involvement of humans uh, in the process. Uh, what, what would you say are the, the challenges uh, that you face um, at Omnibox? Uh, I think that the, uh, one of the biggest issues is that uh, expectations have been set very high by the vendors in terms of what it is they're going to be able to deliver, uh, especially from a voice uh, interface, user interface, uh, how human are the uh, uh, bots going to be, uh, how dynamic is the information going to be. In, in reality, uh, it's, we're still dealing with a world that is mostly based on structured data, uh, and that requires someone, or a lot of people, depending on the companies, uh, involvement in organizing it, uh, you know, great, great amount of jobs out there for data scientists, right, to, to prepare all that data that's going to be trained in various type of models. And so I think that I, Gartner actually predicts that of the, all of the bots that are currently deployed, at least 40% of those bots that are deployed today won't be deployed by next year because they really have missed the mark. Uh, the expectations, not only from the clients, but uh, from the, the businesses themselves, but their customers expect a little bit better than what they're getting today. So I think uh, there's a mis mismatch for sure today, at least in our segment of AI, in terms of expectation of what's, what's real today. Um, I would like to also ask Eva, um, who also mentioned when we talked in our pre-discussion of lack of skills and knowledge as, as something that uh, worries you in particular, and how can we address that? Well, um, I was really encouraged by Willem's presentation on, you know, investment in education across Europe and these special programs. I think that's music to my ears where I'm sitting. Um, Coursera, you know, online courses for further education is also something that Cladera invested to provide. We, we give away curriculum and software for that we search and education ourselves, that's our contribution, so that you shouldn't have you know, limited access to technology being able to do um, proper AI and <laughs> machine learning. Uh, and you, educating more data scientists is kind of a, a right way to go. Um, on, the, on the note of challenges, I think there's one other thing, uh, not necessarily 
explicitly knowledge and skills, but it's, it's a side effect of lack of knowledge. <laughs> and that is the data quality. You know, if you, if you don't understand what data sets you actually need to train a model right, if, to Leo's point, you know, if you train it on human behavior, <laughs> it actually might turn to a not so good service. <laughs> if we are to automate and create services that are better than the human services we can provide by putting humans on a task, we actually need to find the right data sets to train the models on. And that's a that's a <laughs> ongoing, ever repeating conversation I have with these large companies around the world that your model only gets as good as your data. So you have to think about what data actually makes sense, what machine learning algorithm actually makes sense. And then machine learning in itself is a black box today. How do you test it? How do you define it? How do you validate? You know, we all know the, the husky image detection system that turned out to actually react to snow. If you don't know it, Google it. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, how do we know the outcome is actually the outcome we want? So all these are challenges around machine learning today, and there are different ways to mitigate that. Uh, but I think the know-how is education, education, and awareness. And that's where I think I'm directing the question to all the politicians in the room. You know, you, you can't stay in your office and, and talk about AI. You need to go out and educate companies, leadership, organizations worldwide, and make them aware of what's possible, what, what's doable, and what machine learning actually means. I think it, the more awareness out there to make it realistic uh, fosters good discussions and, and leads to those principles we really need to put in place. Thank you ask you the same question. Um, what do you think are the most challenge, the, the biggest challenges now? Uh, at Google, uh, people imagine you have limited resources, um, but I imagine you, you're facing challenges as well, getting talent um, uh, for AI. What, what, what would you see if you look at what people think uh, are the most pressing challenges? Yeah, there are definitely many challenges. I appreciate that skills and knowledge have the most votes. Um, from this audience, I think that's a big one. You know, I joined Google a little bit more than four years ago, and it may be hard to believe, but at that time, actually, fewer than 5% of our engineers at the company had machine learning training. Um, in that time, since the end of 2014 until now, we've had more than 20,000 engineers go through machine learning training. Right? And it's not just engineers, we've had user research designers, we've had product managers, program managers, our legal teams, marketing, all across the board, there is need for some knowledge of machine learning because of how it's really transforming our products and our company. So we've seen that education piece firsthand inside the company, um, and it's been interesting to see that, right? If we can have that turnaround, and we had to do that within four years, I think there's a lot of things and others can take from that too. The machine learning training that we developed internally, uh, it's called Machine Learning Crash Course. It's now available online for free to everybody in more than 12 languages. Um, so that really is a resource for people. I think one of the biggest questions, right, you can identify skills and knowledge as a place where you really need a lot of work, but how and what skills and what knowledge, right? Do you think everybody in the world is going to have to know how to program machine learning? No. That would absolutely be our answer. Not everybody in the world is going to need to know TensorFlow or all of these other types of features, right? But what are the skills people do need? Um, we don't have all the answers, but we've identified a few. One of them we think is going to be very important is the skill and knowledge and ability to learn to learn, right? We know that the world is going to be changing over time. There's going to be a lot of new things to adapt to. So how do you really build that into today's students or today's workers, the ability to learn to learn and really adapt as things are changing? A second thing that we would identify, um, some have started calling it bilingual expertise in machine learning. So we think about Europe, I'm always amazed every time I go there, I feel like people speak many different languages and conversation can change quickly um, from English to French to Spanish, German. Um, 
we want to understand or explore what that would look like for machine learning. Could you add that bilingual expertise to really be able to converse? Maybe you don't need to be an expert, you don't need to be a native speaker. We found that people in dis different disciplines, right, they always speak different languages. What does that bilingual expertise look like so they can converse naturally um, and really accelerate progress across fields? Um, I would say a third thing that we're looking at is this idea of interfaces. So that same thought, you know, not everybody's going to need to learn how to code machine learning. You know, most of this in this room, we probably know how to drive a car, but we don't necessarily know how to build a car, right? And that same thing, we probably don't need everybody to know how to build a machine learning system, but should they know how to operate it? What are the right interfaces, right? What is that ignition or the steering wheel or the brake the kind of things that give people control to be able to interface effectively? Peter, uh, we call this event the European Vision of AI Meets Silicon Valley. What is this European vision and, and where do you see the challenges? I, I think the slide shows worry a little bit. You know, we, we talk about several different dimensions here. The conversation here showed as well, there are different challenges attached to that. Um, and as we start exploring and the technology starts working in our pockets, we also as users start understanding there's a variety of challenges. Now we may identify them and we may have conversations, that's all fine. But I think at a certain point in time, we need to put stuff on paper. I don't think we can sort of live with a conversation about this. We have to live with something which gives us a guidance, which is a guidance for, for firms to operate, for organizations to use it, for people who would like to deploy such systems, and including public government. I mean, the public sector is a big user. I totally agree with that. But what would these people, how, what documents, what guidelines can they rely on to safely deploy such technology? And people are super risk averse. We have been talking a lot to different organizations and stakeholders across Europe. People are risk averse. There are always some who push ahead, fine. But for mainstream adoption, you need to give people guidance. And that guidance, that's not necessarily something meant to stifle the innovation, but this is to lower the business risk. That's what we talk about, you know? Uh, like here in the US, we're in a highly litigious society, so businesses are very careful with the investing because the business could be gone overnight. So that's also something which helps us to address this issue. How can you safely deploy that, considering all the elements we see here, you know? How do we address society? What are the elements you should consider? And give people the best of what has come out of such conversations and other conversations. And in Europe, uh, Leo has gone with a team of 52 people through such a painful conversation, months and months, to look into how can we build something which is useful for people in order to help them to get from where they are into a deployed AI system. And, and you have done tremendous work. I'm really looking forward to the, to the final guidelines. Draft guidelines are out, by the way, so you can easily find them. But there's a final version which is really very clearly decomposing the issues we have been rising here into something we can use in daily business. And this, this is something we, we think we would like to give, not only to companies, to society as something as perhaps useful for in the next one or two years. And maybe they will be revised, and maybe when we learn how things are functioning better. We'll see how we evolve from that, but it's not gonna go without paper. So the EU is, is just about uh, to release some ethical guidelines um, and, and EU has been involved in that. Uh, should these guidelines necessarily come from government, from regulators? Should they come from the industry? Um, should they come from academia, from research? Uh, and how can we all agree on, on these guidelines? Uh, I'd like to know the, your view on this, uh, Karina. Sure, yeah, I, we really appreciate the work of the EU um, high-level expert group and a lot of others who have been thinking about these types of guidelines, right? As a company, um, Google, as we've been developing machine learning tools and products and features, we've had to think about a lot of our own guidelines, right? What do we as a company do? If we're going to be putting out these features or launching products or releasing research papers, we absolutely have to have our own guidelines as to what we want to live up to. Last June, we released a set of Google AI principles together with a um, very technical set of recommended practices around how we put these, um, implementing them into our processes. 
um, and into our products. That being said, you know, there are so many other opportunities for machine learning outside of Google. Um, there's a lot of different ways that societies, um, governments, other companies, academia are using this. And this is really the role of government, right? To bring different people together, to bring together all these stakeholders. Of course, you need people from the technology side with expertise there, but you need people from civil society and from government and who everybody brings their different perspective so that we come to a final set of guidelines that actually is really useful, documented, um, provides guidance to people around the world. So yes, um, obviously that's exactly what we're doing at the forum. So thank you very much for that segue. Um, what, we, what is not on this board that I think we probably should have asked is where's trust and understanding? Because we really need to help businesses understand the impact of AI for good, so um, people like uh, Rene can sell things to them, but also the possible brand risk that they have. And what was interesting was there was a recent Accenture survey where they said that actually um, only 25% of businesses that they polled, and I think they polled some 5,000 businesses around the world, we're actually using AI in more than one vertical. And about 50% weren't using AI at all. And so, you know, if we're thinking about what are the greatest challenges, actually education, so getting those boards and those C-suites to understand the benefit of AI to their company and the fact that they really will be very out of date and might lose their company if they don't go the AI route, but also to understand that if something goes wrong, that's a real backlash on their brand. And so uh, that brings me to the trust piece. Uh, whilst we're talking about skills and education, um, yes, we need more people to understand how to develop AI, but they too, it's part of that learning, need to understand what is the social impact of what we are doing. Because without that, we are not creating human-centered AI. And then um, politicians, somebody said, we've got to get politicians to understand this, but it'd be really good if we worked with the general public to understand this as well. Because that, in my mind, the general public not understanding, understanding sort of the terminator piece of AI could actually be a major obstacle to the progress of AI. So can I just add two things? One thing on the uh, policy, research, academia, and industry working together. I think as a European, now lived here for 15 years in Silicon Valley, that's one thing that's so fantastic about this area that you know, as an example, Stanford, industry and and um, the state, the policy creators are working very closely together. There's not a startup that doesn't touch all three. There's not a, you know, I, I attended this mobility X event about uh, autonomous vehicles, right? There was industry leaders, there were government leaders, there were researchers from Stanford, and they all had this forum as it's really important to them and they sat down and had side discussions. This is just the essence of this area, and I think Europe actually has something to learn from that, to tie industry, academia, and government together tighter than you do have. I, I've worked with German companies, and Scandinavian companies, and British companies overall, so maybe I don't have a fair view, but my understanding is that it's very unique here in Silicon Valley, and it's something I think that's a very good um, uh, point uh, to look at uh, the differences also between Europe and the United States. We'd like to know your opinion on that as well. When it comes to development of the AI ecosystem, the EU and the US are generally on the same track, on different tracks, or not sure how they compare. So we'd like to know that uh, to start off a discussion on comparing um, the two ecosystems in the EU, in Europe, uh, and in the US, maybe also with a particular focus 
on Silicon Valley. I think the trend is very clear. Europe and uh, the US uh, are on different uh, tracks. And I would like uh, to ask you, uh, Rene, um, if, if, you, if that uh, coincides with your experience, um, a Germany-based um, AI company, what are the challenges uh, for European companies and uh, why did you uh, also choose to have a presence here in the US? So actually, we, um, we had originally planned to become a US company, but for various, for various reasons, uh, we decided to stay in Europe and, and become a European champion. Um, that said, either way, whether we were based in Germany or based here in the US, we're looking to be a player in, in both markets. Um, I will say that the topic is not so much, at least at my level and the kind of discussions that we have with uh, enterprise, uh, it's typically not about the differences in AI deployment. It all boils down to privacy, right? Uh, what is it that, what kind of data are you collecting? How are you using it? Uh, how does it get used even in, in job creation or, or reverse creation or uh, job improvements? Uh, those are really the biggest differences that I see. And why is, it, is, is that a challenge or is it just a difference? Um, and what, what were the challenges as, as a business uh, making it, or what are the challenges as a business um, in Europe versus the US? I think that the uh, US companies are, are more open and eager to look at AI as a way of uh, uh, reducing costs, especially uh, reducing employment, um, culling, if you will, the less skilled people. Uh, and, uh, and so for some, it improves jobs, right? But, but the risk clearly is um, the uh, reduction of jobs. We're involved in a particular project in India right now uh, with a large um, BPO contact center kind of company, uh, and their, their, their mission is really to uh, uh, reduce their staff, increase their amount of business, but reduce by as much as 20%, which is a pretty significant impact. So can I add to that? Because I look across industries, and the two strongest areas where machine learning is used is not to reduce jobs, in my opinion. It's actually to optimize processes. So if you're a trucking company, you have predicted maintenance of parts arriving to your next station before the next part breaks. Right? So all these predictive maintenance based on machine learning. Uh, another one is reduce risk. There's an increasing threat within cybersecurity. And many, many companies in any industry you can think of are looking at how to protect their brand or their, um, their data in other ways. So reducing risk and, and cyber security is a big area where machine learning is used today. So you are right in your area of the world. Now, if I look across, it's, it's, that's a, for, from my perspective where I'm sitting, it's a smaller bucket. Right, well, the, our focus is really either humans to machine conversation or yeah. machine to human conversation. So that's where the dilemma is. Jobs or no jobs, right? Uh, Peter, from your perspective, why, why do people have this idea that Europe and, and the US are on different tracks uh, on AI? Well, that's, uh, I mean, I'm not surprised about the outcome. You know, I'm not long enough here to understand how, how certain things can judge. Let me not necessarily comment on the question you asked, but I think there's a fundamental thing we, we all should understand. That I see here in Silicon Valley a lot of AI focus with consumer or, or, or human user related products. That is one world of AI, but that's the small world of AI. Is there only maybe the future 10 billion humans on the planet? There's a large, much bigger AI market out there for, for doing a non-human, non-personal thing. You were talking about predictive maintenance. We can make so many companies smart. And in Europe, the strength is a lot of the business to business. There are great companies you don't know because they deliver products or services to other companies. And AI-fying, I just invented that, AI-fying them, that is our priority. We're working with them, and these are 23 million European 
small and mid-sized companies, taking them into the digital age, and the digital age today means using AI, means using the latest technology. This is our objective. We're not necessarily looking forward to become the greatest champion on, on like the products you do, because Google is hard to compete with. These are companies who have occupied the space already, but there's plenty of other space out there to be occupied. And this is a bit the focus we have. Maybe there's a different race. People very often talk, oh, there's this race to AI. And I always ask the question, what the hell, what's the goal of the race? Where are we racing to? I mean, and I, th I think if we talk about Europe, China, and, and the United States, these are three races, yes, but everybody doubts a different goalpost. Uh, and we may arrive there or may not, that's another question. But there is not necessarily this competitive element people very often bring up in these conversations. Because to paraphrase, and close paraphrase, my, my vice president, when he came here uh, last year to, to talk to companies here, he said, I want a transatlantic market for AI systems. Because I think there is a strong alliance in terms of values and principles we share, and therefore the products and services we develop in AI, either developed here and deployed in Europe, or developed in Europe and deployed here, that should be possible, and that we have to make possible. And that will not come by itself. That's not just by, oh, don't worry about it. Yes, we should worry about it, because we have to make it possible. So I, I want to add an observation, European versus US again. So the companies in the US that I work with, they, they seem to have understood, uh, to Kay's early point, the value of AI or machine learning for how to optimize the business, how to be relevant in tomorrow's market, and, and do uh, this digitalization transition in a smarter way. They have understood the value of that. And in Europe, when I talk, to some companies there, it's more the fear of losing jobs. And I wonder if that's a real observation, or um, I'm actually interested in hearing other people in the panel that reflection on that, because that's worrisome if, if European industry don't realize how they can create more money for all their employees and their customers using machine learning, and the focus is, oh, we want to preserve jobs. No, it's not about that. It's about optimizing and automizing processes in many, many cases. Like, then they're missing out, then Europe will be behind. Sorry. I'm actually not going to answer your question. I just want to add one more piece to the, to the puzzle here. And that is, if you look at the um, investment from VCs, uh, and you look at the whole big pie, and you look at China, and US and Europe, I can't remember exactly the percentage, but it's a really, really small percentage of investment that has been put into AI, European AI companies, by European investors. And it just mirrors, you know, kind of follows what yeah. you're, uh, what you're bringing. More yeah. So there are anxieties, there's uh, sometimes um, also an issue with investment, which certainly now. In our experience, uh, leads many companies from Europe uh, to come here in, in, in Silicon Valley. But you would like to answer? Yeah, I think uh, you have been asking this really, really important question. It's a bit early time in the room, kind yeah. of, you know. And, and frankly speaking, I have read studies about AI and, and diplomacy, so it's my job disappearing, you know. It's, it's, it's everybody who, who should ask that question. And I think we looked in some of the sectors. Um, what looked very bleak maybe a year ago when we didn't have enough sort of evidence and we didn't have enough of the study turned out this year, and I see a notable difference, in a much more positive light. And if you take the, the medical sector, AI will have a, a huge impact on the medical sector. But that doesn't mean there will be less doctors. There will be more treatments. Things which are not treated on our health system today because it runs always at capacity there will be a capacity increase, and there will be a more uh, accurate diagnosis. And so, so it will change it in that way, not necessarily leading to a loss in the healthcare. It will, will for instance, if I stay on health, it will enable the treatment of elderly in a very different fashion, which today is probably not very good in most countries worldwide. <laughs> if we look at the, at the tracking sector, one of them where we say, you know, if autonomous vehicles come, they're all gone. No, they will not be all gone. There will be a transition, obviously. 
Autonomous driving of trucks will be limited always to a certain stretches, but it will take away the shitty part of the job and, and leave the more interesting part of the job. And those of, obviously all of that is conditioned on the speed of change. Uh, because humans are not known for fast learning or adapting. So if we can have the speed of change adapted to the way we learn, if this is over, let's say, a generation stretch, then it will be much easier. And with, with new uh, automation, like autonomous vehicles, there's opportunity to invent new jobs. What comes with that truck when it delivers things? Is there some kind of service that can also be delivered? It, it may not be a truck driver in the car, but there may be other kinds of people and services and other things attached with that new opportunity. Yeah, I think both of those are really good points. If you look, um, right now we have a project in India in the health space actually. So a machine learning model that helps to detect a condition called diabetic retinopathy. So side effect of uh, having diabetes is some people can go blind. Right? This is completely preventable, but not enough people have access to care. Um, there aren't enough doctors in the field um, that are able to serve all the people who have diabetes and are potentially at risk for this condition. And so something that we've started to pilot with clinicians in India is actually this machine learning tool that can assist technicians, right? There are many more technicians um, in the field. They can use this tool um, to help them and, and collectively see hundreds of millions more people that could have been seen by the um, previous physicians who were trained. So that's another example of opportunity. I think, um, you know, Martin, you'd asked the question about the EU and the US. Um, I would agree it's not necessarily the same race. I think there's a lot of opportunities to be complementary. And if I think about what's going on in Europe, right, you've got so many different languages. You've got lots of richness in different types of cities and cultures and um, you know, even different driving conditions. So you want to develop machine learning models that work well in all those conditions. I think Europe has a lot of advantages in there. Um, I would like to ask you also, uh, Kay, from Wealthy Economic Forum's perspective, do you think these fears um, of you know, jobs being replaced by AI are overblown? Um, do you think that governments and regulators are addressing those fears uh, in the correct way? And how is it on a global scale? We're talking about the US and, and Europe uh, at the moment, but uh, generally the, the, the global perspective is also, we of course we have to include Asia, we have to include China, what's going on there. So what would be your, your global perspective? Well, I think one of the, uh, I might start with a article in the New York Times um, by Kai Fu Lee in October, I think, of 2017, where he said that um, the rest of the world should look out for, for America and China because they will become vassal states to America and China's major companies. So what did he actually mean by that? Well, I, what he meant was that there are um, data issues. So you need the first person to the data in Africa, for example, probably is going to be able to lead the AI race in that particular country, um, or what continent, or if we drill down that country. And so um, I think what we're seeing now is, as the EU was mandated, in fact, um, more countries are actually thinking about national AI strategies and from that being able to think about things like employment, how they can gain balance bringing in AI um, to countries like India. India has a national AI strategy. How they going to balance that sort of thing um, much more um, because if you've got a national strategy, at least you have some idea where you might be going and might want to go. Uh, on the actual point of uh, loss of jobs, we just, um, at Davos this year, um, issued a very big paper that we had done um, a study over the last year looking at impact, or, uh, impact on jobs of emerging tech. And um, like most of the other studies that have come out recently, McKinsey, Accenture, PwC, etc., um, we uh, we found that um, yes, there would be from some short-term losses, but overall, 
the, the impact of these emerging technologies will be to create more jobs. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, all our panelists uh, for these insights, uh, comparing uh, Europe and the United States, but also having a global perspective. I think we might continue uh, the discussions uh, afterwards uh, at our networking section. I'd like to thank our partners, the EIT and uh, the European Union delegation uh, for partnering with us and hosting uh, the also the drinks and the buffet afterwards. So uh, I hope uh, you will come to one of our next events uh, soon. We're going to certainly continue this discussion on artificial intelligence, on emerging technologies. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for coming tonight. Yes, the next time.